this series is part of the international studies and global studies focus to bring the world to Wyoming. And we do a series of talks around the state focusing on partnerships with the community colleges. And actually, we're going on the road with this panel discussion to Cody tomorrow, and we'll be in Jackson the day after. So this is part of a larger outreach effort to really bring discussions, high-level discussions, on international affairs and international issues to the people of Wyoming. Um, we bring them here to Laramie, of course, but we also share them with the rest of the state. Um, let me give you a few, uh, let me give a few thank yous and acknowledgments before we get going this afternoon. Um, we really are able to organize these events because of the help of our partners. In the case of this talk, our partner is the Wyoming Humanities Council. Um, up in Jackson, we partner with the Jackson Hole Center for Global Affairs, and we're partnering with the Buffalo Bill Historical Center in Cody. Um, another important um, support for this comes from some of the donors to the Global and Area Studies Program, and that includes the Ruth L. Bogan Foundation. So we're able to bring this series around Wyoming, um, partly due to the support of um, the Albogan Foundation. Um, just in terms of thank yous to people, I'd really like to thank Carlinda um, at AC in the International Studies, Global Studies Office, and also um, Manuel Hoffa McIntyre, who really helped bring this event together this afternoon. So I think I've done the thank yous. Thank you to all of you for coming. Um, let me give you an idea of how this afternoon will proceed. Um, we have um, we have a reception to follow, which you're all welcome to come to. We will have um, comments by uh, Dr. Stephen Krasner, who is our keynote this afternoon. That will be followed by some responding comments from uh, Dr. Tanya Berzel and Dr. Tomas Risa from the Free University of Berlin. Um, so we'll have the we'll have all of those comments. So please hold your questions until then. But there should be plenty of time to discuss any issues you'd like to raise with any of our panelists. So having said that, let me go ahead and do the introductions for our keynote this afternoon. And Dr. Stephen Krasner is from Stanford University. He is the Graham H. Stewart Professor of International Studies, the Senior Associate Dean for Social Sciences for the School of Humanities and Sciences, and the Deputy Director of the Freeman Spokely Institute for International Studies at Stanford. He's held posts most recently in the George W. Bush administration at heading the policy planning staff. For those of you not familiar with the policy planning staff, that's essentially the State Department's think tank for policy. He also held a post on the NSC in the George W. Bush administration. He has a number of titles, and he has a number of publications focusing on democracy and international relations. He is a scholar of international relations, and he's one of the top political scientists in the United States. Um, he received his BA in history from Cornell University, an MA in international affairs from Columbia University, and a PhD in political science from Harvard. So I'm actually going to turn it over to you, Steve, for a few minutes. Uh, please help me welcome Steve Krasner. So, Gene, thank you. Thanks for the nice introduction. Um, thanks for inviting to me in Wyoming. When uh, this opportunity first arose, I mean, I, I had mixed feelings. On, on the one hand, uh, I've hardly been in Wyoming, so I was anxious to come back. On the other hand, I know there are like horses here. And I, I knew that I was traveling a couple of weeks before to Mongolia, and there were horses there too. And they actually got me on a horse in Mongolia, which is a very unnerving thing. If you grew up in New York City and you've never seen a Mongolian saddle, and a Mongolian saddle would even be unnerving for most of you. Um, so I'm, gonna, I'm really looking forward to the trip, and I'm actually hoping that we're going to be able to avoid horses uh, for the rest of the trip. All right, so, you know, 9-11, it's an appropriate date on which to reflect um, on the immediate past and future of American foreign policy. I was working at the State Department on 9-11. Um, you know, for all of us, well, now, of course, we're always in this age when some of the students in the audience are too young to remember these things, which were like completely vivid memories for us. Um, but I remember leaving the building. They dismissed people from the building. I, I, I biked to work. and actually looking, biking over to the Potomac and, and looking at the smoke rising from the Pentagon, it was sobering. 
you know, if we thought about what's happened in the last 11 years, I have to say, I mean, it's a very mixed picture or, or mixed to not so great picture. On the one hand, we haven't had another mega terrorist attack. And I think if we'd, you know, if you'd ask people, kind of done a survey or asked people in the government on September 12th, whether or not they thought there would be more major attacks against the United States uh, in the following decade, certainly most people would have said yes. And, and over this last decade, I've given a number of talks when I've asked people to kind of estimate that percentage. And, you know, people were pretty convinced that there would be more attacks, and there haven't been. So that's a not trivial plus. It's really a big plus, and the world could have been on some very different track if there had been 9-11s and 9-12 and 9-13 or a series of attacks against the United States and other major targets in the West. On the other hand, if we look at a whole series of issues, I would say, over the course of the last 11 years, as Americans, it's worrying. China, uh, obviously, um, you know, much larger economically and um, more assertive than it was a decade ago. Wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, the outcomes of which, I mean, I, I think you have to say are mixed at best. Um, the Arab Spring, in which what's most striking to me um, about the American reaction, and this is not a partisan reaction, is we have no idea how to talk about the Arab Spring. And if you listen to the rhetoric, which, I mean, is both in Romney's, was in Romney's speech at the convention and in Obama's speech at the Democratic convention, in both cases, we talk about the Arab Spring as if this is a decisive movement towards democracy. That's the language. If you look at public opinion surveys in Egypt, for instance, maybe 5% of the people in Egypt actually believe in something like an American conception of democracy. So it's nice that this guy who was the Google representative in Cairo played such a prominent role um, initially in the Arab Spring. But it's very clear that whatever is happening in Egypt or Yemen or Syria is not going to be something that's going to track an American image of what democracy is supposed to be. The 2008 financial crisis, uh, obviously now the Eurozone crisis, so these are a series of kind of very worrying set of developments. How has American, if you looked at, at kind of conceptions, not kind of, if you look at conceptions of American foreign policy, how have American leaders thought about the world that they confronted after 9-11? The Bush administration's national security strategy the first one that appeared in 2002 was, in my view, I mean, it's not that I played any significant role in writing it, a very coherent doctrine. And basically what it said was this. We face a fundamental security threat. That security threat is a product of domestic conditions, primarily in the Arab world. Those domestic conditions are characterized by political repression. If we want to address our security issues, we need to find a way of democratizing the Arab world. That is a, actually a very coherent argument. The problem, I think, and it's something that we've seen over the last decade, is that it's an argument that didn't conform with the reality that confronted us because our ability to actually transform the domestic political environments of countries in the Arab world and beyond has been very limited. Obama came to office, if you look at the 2010 national security strategy, his national security strategy, and talked more about multilateralism. If you look at, I talked about a reset with Russia. Um, if you look, at, for instance, as at one example, um, talked about giving more respect and using multilateral um, institutions more forcefully than the Bush administration had done, although the Bush administration relied very heavily on the United Nations, especially during Bush's second term. Um, uh, what's happened, I think, over the last two or three years is that the Obama administration has kind of moved back from this multilateralism uh, in its rhetoric and in its policy. And, and in many ways, Obama's followed a pretty forceful policy, including a pretty forceful unilateral policy. 
And some of the things that he was very anxious to do at the beginning of the administration, like closing Guantanamo, have proven to be extremely difficult. Yeah. Romney, if you read Romney's foreign policy statements, and I have to say, it was I, I haven't worked in the Romney campaign, so I have no inside dope here. Um, what's striking is I went to the website yesterday uh, to try and read the latest um, from the campaign, and the, I could not find anything that was dated after October 2011. Now, Romney has given some speeches subsequently, but it's simply a testimony to the fact that foreign policy is just not that consequential in the election. It's not even really worth updating what your website is saying. But I think if you look at the, 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 the rhetoric on, 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 in Romney's campaign, you know, it is that the United States ought to be more assertive. It ought to lead more decisively. Um, we need to focus more in the military. I think if you compare side by side, the public statements and public position of Obama and the public statements and public positions of Romney on foreign policy, they are not very different. Uh, and there is a reason for that, and it's the reasons for that that I, I, I want to really focus on um, for the rest of this talk. And I think the reasons are essentially two. One is there are a set of structural constraints in American foreign policy which we can't do anything about and which will constrain any American president regardless of what party they're from or what their underlying political ideology is. That's one constraint. The second constraint, and I think it's actually worse, is that we face a series of problems for which we have no solutions, especially problems that are related to governance issues in, developing, in the developing world and transnational terrorism. These are issues that we've thought about in the government for a decade, thought about intensely, and have not been able to respond with anything that looks like a coherent policy. I'm sure if, I, I'm sure, that's a bad thing always to say, we know from the OJ tribe, should never say that. But I think if I ask you, kind of the audience, you know, you, um, to sit down and, and, and write, a, write a paragraph about um, Obama's grand strategy, and then write a paragraph about Romney's grand strategy, okay, I couldn't do it, and I don't think you could do it, and there's a good reason for that. And the reason is because there is no grand strategy. The United States doesn't have a coherent and has not had a coherent way of thinking about the world since the end of the Cold War. During the Cold War, we had a coherent strategy. It was called containment. It really worked, and we understood what it was. We haven't had a grand strategy since then because having a grand strategy is really hard. It requires having some overarching conceptualization, some word which captures what the government is doing. We have no single word. Neither Obama nor Romney has some single word that captures what their fundamental foreign policy orientation is. One. Two, the conceptualization, if you want to have a, a successful grand strategy, has to actually conform with reality. That means you have to figure out what's out there and the grand strategy that you implement has to be consistent with that. Three, if you have a grand strategy, you have to do hard things in terms of reorganizing the government. It will have impl implications for government budgets. And you can see in this debate between Romney saying on the one hand, we need to commit 4% of our GDP to the military, and Obama saying on the other hand, we need a strong military, but our expenditures have to be based on the challenges that we face. What you see there is, these are hard choices to make. If we decide that we have to make a really serious investment in our submarine force and our stand, way stand offshore um, bomber, bomber um, capability to deal with China, that will be very expensive, and that expense will come from someplace. And that will be hard to do if you don't have a clear conception of why exactly you're doing it. Um, and aside from budgeting and organization, um, you also need to have public support for what you're doing. Otherwise, you won't be able to do these other things. And I think the reason we haven't had a grand strategy is because having all those pieces in place, an idea, an idea that conforms with reality, a set of budget priorities that are consistent with the idea, a set of organizational structures or reorganization of the American government that matters, and the support of the American people, that's really, really hard. And nobody has been able to do that since 1990. And even 
I would say despite the challenges that we've had since 9-11, no politician, not Bush, nobody who's a leader or potential leader of the United States has been able to do that since. Not Bush, uh, not Obama, and not Romney. All right, so let me say a few things about political, what I think are some underlying political conditions which set constraints, I mean, for what, ha what might happen um, in, the, in uh, the future, and then say something about a series of challenges that we're facing and make some predictions, which is always a very dangerous thing to do. Since every study, every systematic study of predictions that people make, including predictions by political scientists, show that they're no better than random. But I'm gonna do it anyway, just so it won't be boring, and maybe for the, for, the, for the end of the talk. So, basic underlying political conditions at a global level. We still live in a world of American preponderance, despite our anxiety uh, about the state of things in the United States. Um, there is no other state in the international environment that rivals the U.S., including China. Um, we also live in a world in which there are surprisingly few direct rivalries among major powers. Um, there has been no war among major powers since 1945. This is the longest period in human history when that has ever happened. I mean, there are a number of different explanations for this. You know, one explanation, I'm, I'm just reading a book by Steven Pinker about, basically it's a book about <coughs> the long-term decline in violence in the world. And he thinks that people's ways of thinking about violence have fundamentally changed. You know, in the, in the Middle Ages, if you wanted to kill somebody, you basically stuck a pike up their middle and you tried to figure out how to make it go through them and have them live for, live for as long as possible. And now we don't do stuff like that anymore. Um, the other argument is that, the other big argument that's out there is that nuclear weapons are so destructive and so unambiguous that there's no doubt that if you had a, a war among major powers, it would be incredibly destructive. But regardless of the reason, no war among major powers. You also do have, for sure, in the Atlantic security community, a situation in which war has become pretty much unthinkable, and that's pretty extraordinary, especially if you could say, if you look at North America, you could say war is unthinkable between the Americans, the Canadians, and the Mexicans, basically because the Canadians and the Mexicans know we could beat them up so, too easily, so they're not actually going to bother us too much. But if you look at the situation in Europe, I mean, Europe is a continent that came close to committing suicide in the first part of the 20th century, two major wars, I mean, had a long history of conflict stretching back centuries and centuries. And the idea that war has become unthinkable between France and Germany, uh, countries which had, were enemies over, over, over decades and, and over centuries, is a very, very um, impressive accomplishment. And in this sense, both in terms of the distribution of power, so we're still in, a, I would say, kind of a unipolar world, and in terms of the relatively benign relations among major powers, it's actually not a bad situation much better than the situation that existed at any point at a global level if you went back before 1945. All right, having said that, um, it isn't to say that there aren't a lot of specific issues that are very challenging for the U.S. Um, and I want to say a few things about, I mean, I sort of run through it, what I see as a few of these major issues, say something about what they mean for challenges for the U.S. and, and, and what, where American policy might go. Um, and I'm kind of picking out what I think are some headline issues, and I'd be glad to talk about these or any others that um, you might want to raise in, in the question period. So, Russia. Um, my view of Russia is that it's fundamentally a mafia state, um, that it's a country in which the personal interests of the rulers, energy policy, and, and, and national interests have become hopelessly confounded. Um, the country's getting billions of dollars. Putin and the people around him are billionaires. Um, anyone who wants to become a billionaire um, has to find some way of making sure that he's closely associated with the president. Um, I think it will be very difficult for Russia um, to pull itself out of the downward spiral that it finds itself in. Um, and it's, if you look at life expectancy in Russia now for Russian males, it's about 57 years. Um, combination of whatever, heart attacks, alcoholism, AIDS. Um, life expectancy in Bangladesh is 68 years. Life expectancy in Mongolia is 68 years. I mean, this is a country that's in a serious state of collapse 
um, in terms of its social capability. The population is declining. It's becoming depopulated in many parts of the country. And it's very hard, to, I would say, to see how this will be reversed um, unless oil prices collapse. There was a story, I mean, I thought, which in some ways encapsulated, I mean, Russia's very sorry state of affairs um, in the New Yorker about a year ago. So this was a story about um, uh, a Russian teenager who had invented chat roulette. Yeah, see, I know that some of the younger people know what chat roulette is, and all the older people like me have really no idea what it is. But some of you younger people know what it is. So this kid invents chat roulette, um, and the program's really popular. They sort of start to think about um, turning it into a company in Moscow, and they find that they can't do it. So the kid's 17 years old, and he moves to Palo Alto. I mean, if you have a country like that, it's just doomed. You know, in which anyone who has a great idea is going to have to escape the place to be able to develop the idea. So I'm really skeptical about Russia in terms of its future trajectory. Um, I think it's a, a, an annoyance for the United States. Um, I don't think it is a critical threat for the United States. Middle East, Palestine. Um, so I... Um, I spent a week in Israel um, in June, and it, it really, usually when you do so, things like this, they don't change your mind, but I have to say the trip really changed my mind about um, a couple of things, one of which um, was Iran, which I'll talk about in a second, and, and the second was the prospects for peace in the Middle East. I think there's no possibility of a peace in the Middle East, and I think there's no possibility for two reasons. One is, on the Palestinian side, not only are there deep political divisions between um, Hamas on the one, one hand and the Palestinian Authority on the other, but it's also been the case that at any moment when some Palestinian leader reached out to try and reach a settlement with the Israelis, um, there have always been some spoilers that could play the terrorist card to derail that movement. The second thing, and this is where I changed my mind, um, I, my thinking had been before this trip that demographics were really problematic for Israel. Um, and that if you look at population growth rates over the next 10, 20, 30, 40 years, you know, it looks like there were going to be a lot more Arabs than there are Jews. And given that situation, there would be a lot of pressure for Israel to try and find a settlement. I, I'm not sure that's the case anymore. And here's why. One is that if you look at the present situation, most of the Palestinian population on the West Bank is limited to 17% of the land, which is Area A under the Oslo Accords, not much of the actual territory. Um, secondly, the Israelis essentially control access, taxation, and security. So not only have they built a security barrier, which is sometimes a wall and sometimes not, um, but they also control border movements across from Israel into um, both Gaza and the West Bank. We visited the main border crossing between Israel and, um, and Gaza, which is the Rafah border crossing. Here's how it works. A truck comes from Israel. It pulls into the border crossing. They unload all the stuff off the truck, and they put it, into the put it on the ground. And they put it on the ground in like a room that's it's probably about 75 yards by 75 yards, much bigger than this just down in the sun with these huge concrete barriers all around the room. The Israeli truck drives away. Another truck comes in. This other truck is a truck that's employed entirely by the Rafa border crossing. It takes up the stuff off the ground. You put it onto that truck. It, that truck then drives about 200 yards into Gaza, where it takes the stuff off the truck again and puts it down on the ground and then drives back into the border crossing, at which point the stuff is picked up by the pa a Palestinian truck and taken into Gaza. All right, this is not only time consuming, I mean, if you're trying to export tomatoes from Gaza, it isn't so great to have your tomatoes sitting in the sun all day. It's in incredibly expensive. All right, so why did this happen? They originally had the border crossing operating in which you'd have an Israeli truck drive up, you'd have a Palestinian truck drive up, behind, you know, so they, they were back to back, and you'd take the package off the Israeli truck and put it into the, into the Palestinian truck. Fine. Why didn't that work? Because they drove a Palestinian truck into the border crossing that was filled with explosives and they blew it up. 
So the Israelis decided we're not going to do that. But the point for me was in seeing this border crossing is how much control the Israelis have over the Palestinian population, a huge amount. And it means, I think, it's not so clear in 20 or 30 or 40 years exactly what the demographics will be if you're looking at Gaza and the West Bank. So the Israelis are looking at this situation now and they're saying, we tried negotiations, we got the intifada. We tried unilateral withdrawal, um, you know, first from Lebanon and then from Gaza, and what we got were rockets. You know, when we actually went into the West Bank and took control of security and when we invaded Gaza and Lebanon, we actually got security within Israel itself. So I think from the Israeli point of view, there's very little incentive to actually move forward regardless of what the Israelis are saying. And I think regardless of whether it's Netanyahu um, or somebody else. And I think on the Palestinian side, not only is it very difficult for the Palestinians to develop a coherent policy, but uh, it's also the case that even if you had a coherent Palestinian policy from the Palestinian leadership, it's too easily derailed by terrorist activity by even a relatively small part of the Palestinian population. So every American president has said, I want peace in the Middle East. And every time this has happened, and we've looked at the failures, like if you looked at Camp David under Clinton, the interpretation is, you know, if Arafat had only taken a somewhat longer vision, this is one interpretation, it would have worked. Or if the Israelis had only been a little more forthcoming, it would have worked. I don't think it's like personality anymore after this last trip. I think structurally, it's not going to happen. And actually, it would be better if the Americans step back from saying that they're going to find some solution to this. All right, one big problem, I think huge structural problems in terms of actually finding a solution. North Korea, um, a second huge problem. So here's where I think the fundamental strategic problem is vis-a-vis -vis North Korea. If you look at the preference orderings that the Americans and the Japanese have, they're very different than the preference orderings that the China, Chinese and the South Koreans have. So if you look at both all of the parties in the six party talks, forgetting about the Russians for a second, everybody's first best outcome is no loose in a stable North Korea. That's the first best outcome for everybody. But what happens if you can't get that? The next best outcome for the Americans is no loose in a stable North Korea. What's the next best outcome for the Chinese and the South Koreans? It's a nuclear North Korea that's stable. If North Korea falls apart, it's going to be unmanageable for the South Koreans and the Chinese. Uh, if you look at the cost, the amount of money that West Germany spent trying to integrate East Germany, uh, not only were those countries closer together in terms of uh, GDP per capita, much closer, the population differences were, small, were more significant. East Germany was relatively smaller. And it's proven to be unmanageable. So there is a fundamental problem. The Chinese are not going to pressure the North Koreans. And partly because they're worried about security concerns, but it's also partly because they don't want to pressure the North Koreans so much that North Korea falls apart. How could this change? The only way in which this could change is if the North Korean regime, under its new dear leader or whatever his, his, his name is now, Kim Jong-oh, um, decides that they want to follow a different policy, they could follow a Chinese path of reform. And there's some hints that they'll do this. But this is such a, a, a personalistic, family-oriented regime that opening up the system will inevitably mean that the Kim family will lose power. So it's not clear that it's going to happen. So problem number two, no uh, clear and obvious solution. Transnational pro terrorism. Uh, Here's a big issue, and this is something that I think Dick Cheney said, focused on it. I think that Dick Cheney was right, um, although it poses very big, very big policy ch challenges. Small chance of an extremely bad thing happening. The extremely bad thing is a nuclear weapon blowing up in the United States or Europe. It's not hard to tell a story about how that would happen. Pakistan has nuclear weapons. It's not clear that they're completely secured, and Pakistan could fall apart. Iran conceivably could get nuclear weapons. If it got nuclear weapons, it's not clear that the state could control them, and it is the case that in the case of both Pakistan and Iran, there might be some incentive 
to actually providing the weapons to transnational terrorist groups. It's not clear if you're thinking about Pakistan or Iran that if they, Iran, in the Iranian case, if they have nuclear weapons, that they would have sophisticated levels of control over these weapons. All right, here's the problem. What, what level of insurance, what's the, how much of an insurance policy do you take out to deal with this threat? You know, I have to say now, looking in retrospect, and I worked in the Bush administration, I think Afghanistan was okay. I think we paid too high a, too high a premium in Iraq, partly because we misunderstood what the situation was in Iraq. Um, and it wasn't actually clear at the time that the administration made the decision to invade, um, that it could have known everything that it knew after the invasion took place. But I think transnational terrorism is a, we've done really well. We've done really well through policing. Um, it's not a problem that's necessarily going to go away. And although it's been kind of in a abeyance for the last 10 years, it isn't clear that it isn't going to come back um, to bite us. But again, the reason we don't have a grand strategy is we don't have a coherent way of talking about this problem. It's a really hard problem. The coherent way of talking about it would be to say, here's the insurance, here's the chances of this happening. We don't know what the chances are. Are the chances vanishingly small or 5%? And if we knew what the chances were, we might be able to say something about the insurance policy we would pay. So do you want to spend 4% on the defense budget? 3%, 7%? If I told you, told you for sure, that unless we increase our defense expenditure by 25%, there will be a 10% chance of a nuclear weapon exploding in the United States in the next 20 years, for sure the United States, the American people would endorse that increase in defense expenditure. But all of those percentages are like completely pulled out of the air. We have no idea what they actually are. Iran. All right, this is something else I concluded from my, my trip to Israel. Um, before I went, I actually thought the Israelis were not going to attack. And I thought that it was just cheap talk. Because it's in their interest to say, we're going to attack, we're going to attack, with the hope that we, the Americans, will attack. So there wasn't, I thought, any sort of obvious reason to be necessarily believe them. And besides that, I also thought the, that the Iranians had a very effective deterrent or retaliatory measure, which is rockets that they could fire from Lebanon. There are thousands of rockets in Lebanon now, and these rockets can reach Tel Aviv. They can reach all the population centers in Israel. All right, after, I mean, listening to a number of Israelis talk about this, I actually thought the opposite. So one is, the Israelis talking about this as an existential threat. That's a real thing. Um, when you have the leaders of another country saying that Israel should be wiped out, Israelis, because of their history, they actually take that seriously. Um, because they know that unthinkable things actually can happen. But the other thing that I hadn't grasped is that it's not in the interest of Hezbollah to simply rain rockets down on Israel. If that happens, the Israelis will surely reoccupy southern Lebanon. And that's not in Nasrullah. Nasrullah is the head of, of Hezbollah. It's not in Nasrullah's interest for that to happen. On the other hand, it's not in Nasrullah's interest to do nothing because if he does nothing, he'll stop getting money and support from Iran. So I think what you would predict is, and this is my guess is this would be Israeli thinking, that um, there will be some rockets from Lebanon. The numbers will be not that high. There'll be, there'll be losses which Israel is willing to sustain. So I do think the Israelis are willing to attack. It isn't completely, I mean, if, here's, here's where I'm really going to go, like walking off the plank, not even walking on the plank, just jumping right off. I mean, I, the prediction would be if it looks like Obama is going to win, um, I think there's a strong incentive for the Israelis to attack before the election because they'll be somewhat more secure in getting support from Romney, even though I don't think Romney or, I don't think either Romney or Obama is going to actually put American planes in the air um, to support um, an, an Israeli strike. But um, I think Netanyahu thinks he would get more support from Romney. But if, if there is an attack before the election, Obama will not be able to walk away from that. All right, you can write to me on election day saying, Krasner, one more wrong prediction. But there it is. Um, so that's what I think will happen in Iran. Iran is, look, also an incredibly hard problem. So let's say there is a strike and it, there's some possibility you know, and I think this is, this is what the Israelis think, but it's not just the Israelis, that you could put the Iranian nuclear pro program back by three to five years. 
All right, fine. You still haven't changed the regime. There's a good chance that you'll increase support for the regime. The Iranians are clearly going to launch terrorist attacks around the world, including in the United States, if they can. So it's not as if you're going to say, great, we're going to attack them, take out their nuclear program for three to five years, and we'll just set them back. I mean, it's really a hard choice. I mean, I think it's very, I think Iran with nuclear weapons is extremely dangerous. But it's also true that setting back their program um, by having an Israeli, an Israeli attack on their nuclear facilities is not the end of the program um, and would have bad consequences. So these are really tough problems. All right, finally, I'm going to end with um, just a few comments about failed and badly governed states, um, which I know is something that um, Gene and other people here have been interested in. Um, it's something that Tomas and Tanya and I have been working on. This issue of having m many states in the world which are badly governed, in some cases failed, not providing ad adequate se security for their populations, in some cases generating security risks for the United States and the rest of the industrialized world, this is a really tough problem. And I will say, if, end by saying, if you look at foreign assistance over the course of the last 60 years, foreign assistance has been great if you're looking in some areas like health, immunization programs, increases in life expectancy. It's actually been very impressive if you look at agriculture and caloric intake around the world. Really pretty good. If you look at democratization and economic development, very hard to demonstrate that foreign assistance has done any good at all. So we have this, a lot of states pretty badly governed around the world. Um, you know, in Africa, parts of Africa, parts of Asia, in some cases in Latin America, not a very clear idea what we should do about this. So another huge structural problem. All right, finally, 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 I'm going to stop. I promise to stop at 35 minutes. Two seconds on China. So we, I, I think we handed out this little distribution of power in the world chart in 2025. It's clear that China is rising, um, that, um, it's, um, that it's a really, you know, it's a significant, it's a very significant power. Um, that this is a long-term trend. It isn't clear where China's going. It isn't clear how this will play out in terms of China's domestic politics and its domestic um, economic growth. If you look at this scandal over Bo Lai and his wife, you know, kill this British guy, you know, the son is driving his Ferrari around Oxford and Harvard or wherever it was. Um, you know, it's pretty strange. And you can see these guys still don't exactly have it completely down. You know, China might continue to do great, it might not. Um, I do think that the, the kind of strategy that the US will follow vis-a-vis -vis China is pretty clear. It's critical for the US to maintain a security, a strong security presence and economic presence in, in, in East Asia. And it's clear that the United States needs to do that to reassure its major allies, the Japanese and the South Koreans, that we're going to be there. But you can see that even if you look at the neighboring countries, they're very worried about China. If you look at Burma and this set of reforms in Burma, okay, I'm not an expert on Burma, but I think that they introduced this set of reforms. Why? Not because the military leadership suddenly had some kind of epiphany about the importance of democratization. It's because they were only dealing with China. China was everything. China was making all the investments all of their raw materials were going to China. They had no opening to the West, and they took these internal reforms because they regarded themselves as being too isolated. You know, just having spent this week in Mongolia, which I do recommend, it's a very interesting place. Um, and you guys from Wyoming, I have to say, Wyoming is actually much better looking than Mongolia, even though Mongolia is pretty good looking. But, um, you know, they're surrounded by Russia and China. This is like a very, very, very difficult place to be in. 80% of their investments are coming from China. You know, they're kind of trying to find ways to get a little bit of wiggle room. So East Asian countries are clearly extremely nervous about China. They're extremely nervous about potentially being within a kind of Chinese hegemonic area. The Chinese would like to create such an area. I think the United States will, and this will be true regardless of who wins a presidential election, try to balance this out. So in closing, I think if you look at this whole set of problems which the U.S. confronts, 
The one problem which we can speak about, I would say with some degree of confidence and coherence is China. We know that China is rising. We know that the United States is not going to try to isolate China. We know that it will try to maintain a major presence in East Asia, um, and that we will try in some ways to balance against China, or at least not to allow China to be, become a dominant hegemon in East Asia. If we look at this wide range of other problems, which we just kind of run through, Iran, Palestine, uh, the Arab Spring, um, Afghanistan and Iraq, which we could talk about at greater length, these are not even problems which you can talk about in such a coherent way. They're really hard. And I think the single, single characteristic which defines all of these very hard problems is they're not problems generated by the international distribution of power, which is a problem, which is a Chinese problem. We kind of know how to think about that set of problems. Rising power, even if we move from a unipolar world to a bipolar world, we have some sense of how to think about their pro that problem. The other problems are all problems generated by the character of domestic political regimes in these other countries. And our ability, our knowledge about how to affect those developments is much, much more limited. All right, so I'm, I hope that's generated some questions, and I hope I, at least I walked off the plank once. And anyway, I know that my colleagues will not leave me standing unscathed. <laughs> I'm going to invite, I'm going to introduce our two responders. They only have five minutes, so in some ways they have a tougher, um, a tougher task. So I think they might be selective in their comments in response to some of the provocative comments that, that Steve Krasner's raised. Uh, Tomas Risa uh, is a director of the Center for Transnational Relations, Foreign and Security Policy at the Otto Sur Institute of Political Science at, I'm going to say it in English, Free University of Berlin. He's got a number of publications that you can see in your program. Um, he's been associated with the Peace Research Institute in Frankfurt, the University of Constance in Germany, Cornell, Yale, and actually here at the University of Wyoming many, uh, many years ago. So he has a link to Wyoming. Um, his PhD is from the University of Frankfurt. Um, He'll be, making, uh, he'll be making the first set of comments. He'll be followed immediately by uh, Dr. Tanya Berzel, who's also from the Free University of Berlin. She's professor of political science and chair in European integration. Um, at the Free University of Berlin, she has held posts at the University of Heidelberg. She's an adjunct member, along with uh, Tomas here in the uh, Global and Area Studies Program. Um, they actually have a home up in Centennial, so they spend some time around here. And so we're really happy to have them back to make some of their comments, and we'll see if they agree. So, um, uh, Tomas. No, we never <laughs> agree, so <laughs> that's absolute. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Jean. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I'm not sure whether this is now the, the view from Centennial or the view from Germany or, or, or some sort of melange mixture uh, uh, of both. Let me, um, so I don't do, a, because I have only five minutes and I've reminded, have been reminded by Tanya on that and Jean, so I, uh, um, very quickly, why on the last point by Steve and why that has something to do uh, with, if you want, the renaming or the new title of this pro uh, program, Global and Area Studies. What Steve was talking about when he talked about these structural problems that, are, that have no easy kind of solutions, that exactly is, I think, exemplified by this uh, title here, Global and Area Studies. On the one hand, all these problems have a global component. You know, the story about Rafa and the Israeli tracks, and, and that is extremely local. At the same time, it is part of a global problem, i.e. the Middle East problem where we, where we currently talk about, uh, about which we currently talk about. Um, and, and you could go on and on. So you have the, the and this is why I find it absolutely correct and, and, and good uh, that the program was re renamed. The, the, most of these problems are problems that link the global level to the local level and the other way around, which also means you have to have, you have to know a lot about a country. I could go on, Steve, and tell you, for example, that what you experienced in Rafa is not going to go on in Ramallah when, they, when the Israeli Turks go into 
the West Bank because that is very different. It happens in Rafah because Rafah is part of Ga or is the border crossing to, to Gaza, which is governed by the Hamas, and that's essentially a state of war, if you want, or a cold, very cold war. Uh, so, so it's even more local than uh, than you think. So, so that was my f uh, first comment. Second comment. Uh, Unfortunately, I agree with Steve on <laughs> most. Yeah, this is like most 20 years old. Right? You have no idea how hard it is for him to say that. <laughs> this is really difficult. I don't know. So, I, so I was thinking about this great power issue. You know, what kind of world are we living in? So here's my little spiel on great powers. What do you need to be uh, to to have in order to be be or become a great power? Number one, you need to have some cap capabilities, power. And that is the little graph that um, Steve distributed. I have one thing to add to that. Uh, it's not just about material capabilities. It is also about idea ideational capabilities and about the attractiveness of the country. This Russian kid that goes over to Palo Alto because I have... Uh, could somebody at some point explain to me what this was about? This no, you're, I have absolutely public, no clue. But okay, but anyway, in the look, reception, I know some of the younger all right, people. Just out. explain it to me. But anyway, so he goes to Palo Alto because he can't uh, can't do that in Russia. If you look at the University of Wyoming, this, uh, the students here from China, uh, uh, from from all over the world who are here, uh, that that is part of a power capability. Now, if you factor that into your graph, uh, actually, two powers go up, and it is. The U.S. The U.S. is then even bigger, and by the way, I would say also Europe. At, at least we try. So, <laughs> second thing you need as a power, uh, I call it the three P: power in terms of capabilities. Second, some sort of purpose, some sort of vision, what you want to do in the world. Now, Steve just said that the U.S. has no grand strategy. Now it's very hard for, for a big government, a big country where you have all kinds of forces fighting each other, etc., all the time to come up with a grand strategy. So I would give the US actually a benefit of the doubt here, but we can discuss this further on. And third, the, th the third P to become uh, 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 or to be a, a, a great power is practice. I mean, you have to put your words, uh, you, uh, you have to. Uh, 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 to put some practice behind your, behind your words. And again, on the 3P, I think the U.S. is being doing quite well. We could, I see a lot of problems. It's not, uh, preponderance, I'm not sure about that. Unipolar polar world, I'm not so sure about that. But the U.S. is, is, is doing pretty well. Uh, Europe, I, I'm supposed not to talk about Europe because Tanya does this. Uh, so Europe, very briefly. Um, power capabilities, yeah, we do. Even the ideational, the attractiveness, yeah, might, might have been weakened in, in, in recent uh, years because of the Euro crisis, but it's okay. Uh, Europe does have a purpose in terms of a grand strategy. We call it effective multilateralism. On the one hand, multilateralism, but you're at the same time, so you work through international institutions, the UN and the rest of it, uh, but you have to put, uh, uh, you have to have some teeth uh, two. Now, and this is where I think where I completely agree with Steve on this big rise of the BRICS, the, the, uh, the new great powers rise of China. Go through them one by one. Yes, they have capabilities. No, they have no purpose other than veto power uh, and very little practice. There are regional powers at the moment and actually the proof of the pudding for me is China. China is where China does employ purpose and practice, we might not like that purpose, but where it does employ purpose is actually in its region. It is a regional power. Same is, 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 is true for Brazil, same is proof, uh, true for Russia and the rest of it. And I'm almost done, five minutes I'm done. I had uh, two more things on foreign <laughs> policy and one on uh, transatlantic relations. The one on foreign policy, unfortunately, I do agree with Steve on that one. Uh, uh, for me, and that is now the view from both Centennial and from Berlin, Germany, uh, in foreign policy terms, Romney and Obama make no difference. We don't think, I would, uh, we can discuss this back and forth. R currently, 
I mean, to the extent that uh, Romney has a foreign policy strategy, and uh, you just heard that the last update was from October 2011, it, there's some rhetoric, and he made some mistakes on his Europe trip, but I don't see much, uh, m much going on here. And my sense is that the US will be preoccupied with itself and its own economy in the next four years, no matter what. And that will dictate how they will view foreign policy. That, uh, on, the, on the transatlantic relationship, it's sort of lingering on. As uh, Steve uh, said, we are a transatlantic security community, so no war. Actually, the trade conflicts are also, uh, at the moment, uh, okay. But one thing I think um, is, 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 is very interesting, and, and then I hand it over to, uh, to Tanya. For the very first time in years, the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Los Angeles Times, the Chicago Tribune, and other American newspaper pay close attention what this very funny creature, European Union, is doing. That there is a European Central Bank, that there are, you know, there's a Council of Ministers and a European Council, nobody really knows what that is and what they do. But the, all of a sudden you get these questions when you're sitting in Berlin by these correspondents. So what, how do I have to interpret this? Why? Beca and, and, and what it shows to you is that the Euro crisis, and hopefully we, I mean, Tanya is going to talk about this, I guess. Um, hopefully we get over with this at some point. But how can, again, it comes back to this global how interconnected the world is and how, how globalized the economy is because it makes a huge different difference for the US economy in the next three to five years, whether the Europeans can get the Euro crisis under control or whether the whole fabric of European integration um, collapses. Please. <laughs> okay. That was seven. Thank you. Anyway, okay, I'm going to use at least half a minute of my five minutes for thank yous. And I want to thank the Global and Area Studies Program, particularly the director, Jean Garrison, for bringing Steve Krasner to Wyoming. Not only was Steve my academic hero when I was in graduate school 25 years ago, um, apparently we also share a passion for horseback riding, Steve. Um, <laughs> and I, I haven't had the opportunity to practice that passion in Mongolia, so I might take you up on that invitation. But I've been uh, pursuing that passion pretty much here in Wyoming, thanks to Tammy, Dana, and I think Anna here, three wonderful people from Wyoming who have given me the opportunity to pursue that passion. Okay, and I'm very pleased to see that they're all here, so again, because it allows me to bring together the two different worlds, academia and horseback riding. And <laughs> apparently I'm not the only one. Anyway, okay, so I'm supposed to talk about Europe, and um, I could be done with it pretty quickly, because a lot of, I'm afraid to say, Americans think either Europe is completely irrelevant, or they take it for granted. Um, to some extent, Europe doesn't seem to, I mean, it may be that U the US doesn't have a grand strategy to begin with, but even if it had a grand strategy, I don't think Europe would feature very prominently in that grand strategy. And um, you, you may say that the good news is that, you know, we've been friends for such a long time, so we don't really have to make a big fuss out of that. But um, I think it is still interesting to talk about Europe, because unlike the US, maybe, Europe does have a grand strategy, uh, particularly at the end of the, of the, of, of the, of the uh, Cold War. And I'm not sure whether the grand strategy is very original, and I think we share it with the US. You don't make such a big fuss out of it. But I mean, our grand strategy, our responses to all the challenges Steve has pointed out is democracy and market economy. And that's what the EU has been trying to promote ever since the end of the Cold War. And we've made that, we call it the European Security Strategy, and we believe the world would be a safer and more prosperous place if all countries became democracies and have market economies. And this is not only a kind of a belief, we also have developed a kind of set of instruments to promote. And now the interesting thing is, and I think here we differ slightly, is that Europe pursues these goals, the strategy, by mostly, mostly using economic incentives and financial and technical assistance. So we have largely refrained from using coercion. Um, whether this is a good or bad thing, 
that's a different discussion, but I think we have been acknowledged by other countries as a kind of counter model to the US in terms of how you promote the shared values of democracy market economy. Um, now, so in, in, if I use Thomas's three Ps, the EU does have a purpose. And I would also argue the EU is a power. If you look at the little graph, you know, we might rank behind China and we might be in decline, which I think is more a demographic than anything else problem. But I think the EU, unless a lot of people would argue, does have power. We are the largest trading bloc in the world. We're the largest donor of official development aid in the world. And some of our member states are pretty prominent members of international organizations, including two of the five permanent members of the United Nations Security Council. So the EU yields a lot of economic and political leverage in the world. Now, if you look at its actual influence, here we come to the practice, different story. So there is, I would say, a gap, uh, some would argue a growing gap between purpose and power on the one hand and practice on the other. Now the big question, is why is and I think it has a lot to do with the constraints Steve was talking about. Um, if you look at what the EU has been doing ever since the end of the Cold War, we've been pretty successful in turning our immediate neighborhood, Central Eastern Europe, into an area of democracies and market economies, right? The Central Eastern European countries, many of which have joined the EU by now, are stable democracies. Well, I mean, we can talk about Bulgaria and Romania. We've miserably failed on our eastern neighborhood. The entire post-Soviet area is not even close to democratizing. It you know, looks more like Russia than the EU. And if you look to the southern neighborhood, um, North Africa, Arab Spring, we've talked about it, the same. Europe has supported rather than, has supported the dictators rather than supported democratic change. So there is a problem with our practice here. The practice doesn't match the purpose and the power we would have to put this practice into, uh, this purpose into practice. Now, um, just a very, I'll come back to why that is, um, but I want to very great, I'll use a minute if I have, just to respond on how Europe sees the challenges you've been talking about, the constraints for US foreign policy. Russia, you said Russia is an, a nuisance, an annoyance. Well, you know, Europe gets 23% of its energy from Russia. Plus, you know, Russia is exporting its nuclear te technology to countries we're not very comfortable with anyway. And thirdly, given our history, a lot of our member states don't feel very comfortable about Russia. They actually see it as a real threat. So we cannot simply ignore Russia. We have to engage with Russia, deal somehow with it. Um, that's one thing. The Middle East, um, there's a lot of people who argue that the Middle East is we all like the idea of two states, but we also know that we're not going to get there anytime soon. So what we're essentially hoping is that, you know, the status quo somehow continues. So what the EU is really after, and I come back to that, is stability. Now, Asia, interesting, I think there is a really big difference between the US perception and the EU perception, I'm almost done. The EU perceives Asia more as an economic challenge and a security threat. I mean, you know, our Chancellor uh, Merkel was just over in China and a Washington correspondent called me up and said, do we have to be worried about German foreign policy because Merkel is going to China? I said, what are you talking about? China is our most important trading partner. We're not going to get tough on China because of human rights. I'm very sorry. And that's the general perception of the, you know, of the EU towards Asia. Asia is an economic challenge we have to come to terms with. For us, we don't really see it as a security threat, and I think that's interesting. Uh, last point, failed and failing states. Here the EU, again, what the EU is trying to do is not only to provide services in these countries where the states are not capable of doing it or not willing, the EU is actually trying to change institutions, turning them into democracies and market economies. Not very successful, I have to say, and that will be my final word, is why is it that the EU has a purpose and a power, but it doesn't match its words with deeds. The practice does not conform to the purpose. And the reason is because the EU is generally interested in stability and turning countries into democracies and market economies in the long run may, may make the world a better place. But in the short run, it creates instability. And that's our problem with Syria. This is why the EU will not get involved in any way in Syria. This is why we have stayed back in the Arab Spring. And that explains a lot what the EU is doing. So and this is really my final sentence. <laughs> is this good or bad news? I think the fact that the EU is not 
willing and capable to promote, to put its purpose into practice, might not such a bad thing after all. Because whenever countries have tried to change other countries, you know, I mean, I don't want to talk about Afghanistan and Iraq here, but um, I do believe that external actors cannot change domestic politics of other countries. What they can do is they can support homegrown, homegrown changes. And that's what the EU has been doing pretty effectively. Um, and, the, and the last point really is what the EU is about, I know that's a clever strategy, what the EU is about is its power of attraction. Thomas already mentioned that. Other countries are, copy, are copying our policies and institutions, including Asia, by the way, because the EU is considered to be a model of success. And the, EU, the, French, the Euro crisis will not change this because both Asia and Latin America have undergone financial crises, and their response has been regionalism. And the way the EU, and I'm happy to discuss that, has been responding to the current financial crisis, I think is quite remarkable given that the EU is not a state, but a federation of member states. And we've invested quite a lot of money in bailing out other countries. I'm done. Okay. <laughs>
Um, my name is Carolyn Smiley. I'm a freshman and I'm studying political science and history. And what should the United States' stance on um, Israel, Israel and Palestine be? Steve, do you like to? Okay, so let me take a, take a quick shot of both of those. So I think the, the issue for the Chinese visa in North Korea is that the Chinese will be anxious about putting too much economic pressure on North Korea and having the regime fall apart suddenly. And you're then going to be confronted with 20 million North Koreans impoverished, you know, completely, you know, many completely indoctrinated, not really able to function in a, a Chinese environment or a South Korean environment. If those people try to move into China or North Korea, when you shoot them as they move across the border, uh, would you try to keep them in the country? How would you feed them? So having the regime fall apart is something that would be really difficult for the South Koreans and I think also for the Chinese to manage. And that's what they're worried about. They don't want to put so much pressure on the North Korean regime that it will fall apart. Now, they have been encouraging the North Koreans to adopt Chinese reforms. And that would be great because if the North Koreans did that, they'd have more economic growth. You know, over the long term, there might be some prospect of integrating North and South Korea someplace decades from now. As I said, the, the, this new leader, I mean, appears to be making some reforms. I think that reforms will be very difficult for the North Korean regime because the regime is just a family business, literally a family business, the Kim family business. And if they make reforms, it's, it's, it won't just be able to stay a family business. That's the problem. Um, I think on the, on the Israeli-Palestinian um, situation, you know, honestly, I, I think now, for a long time, I thought, you know, look, the solution is obvious. It's a two-state solution with the 67 borders, you make a few sort of two, three percent exchanges. It looks clear what the solution is, and for both parties, there would be a strong incentive to arrive at agree to that. I just don't think that's going to happen now because A, the level of distrust is so high on both sides, and B, because I think both sides think that time is on their side. The time is on their side is the demographic argument. They both both sides think they're going to win, and therefore, they're not going to settle. And as a result of that, I think, you know, if I were the American president, I would stop talking about making peace in the Middle East. Which, I mean, every American president has done, you know, for the last 15 years. Um, you know, since Carter, or before. I would actually stop doing it, because I don't think we're going to be successful. And, and Steve says, then, no. But for exactly the reasons that Steve points out, uh, the solution is there. We have, have had that solution. I mean, we know for at least 10 years what the solution is. We were in Camp David and Tawa. That was, when was that, 2001? Yeah. Uh, that's, that's the deal. The deal is absolutely clear. Why doesn't it happen? Because both sides think they have time on their side. I am not as, where well, I disagree with Steve and what he said in, the, um, in, in, in his talk, uh, I think both sides make major mistakes in terms of that belief. I think it's, it, it, it's the wrong belief. The Israelis do not have time on their side. Uh, on short term, absolutely. They're absolutely the dominant military power. And uh, Steve, I'm a bit surprised that you didn't take that rhetoric or the talks about that uh, Israel perceives an Iran, or, uh, 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 a nuclear armed Iran as an existential threat and will prevent this. And Israel is working on this for the last three years and it's working on this without, and, and trying to make sure they can do it without the United States. So at this point it's even irrelevant whether Romney, Obama, etc., what they do in this kind of context. And by the way, I'm pretty, I'm pretty worried about I'm extremely worried because we have had a lot of miscalculations in the Middle East in the last 30 to 40 years on either side. So, you know, I mean, it's not a nice picture. I'd like to take a couple questions from this side, right here in the second row on the far side, and then the row behind. My name's uh, Randy Elledge, and 
I was wondering, or I'm a freshman here in my major in economics. Uh, so looking at this idea of, in the United States, how we have two parties here, Romney and Obama, and luckily they have the same kind of outlook on international relations. Could we see a problem potentially in the future when we have two different parties who want two different things in the international stage and then see a purpose in the United States rapidly decrease and the great power decrease? Raise your hand again, please. Um, my name is Nico Colas. I'm a sophomore political science student. My question is kind of similar to his. Um, is the U.S.'s apparent lack of strong foreign policy, do you think that will lend itself to us getting involved more or less in the going on of the world? Like, will it lend itself a certain reticence or to get involved, or will it kind of give us a recklessness because we don't actually know what we want to do, so we'll get involved more or less? I don't know if that really makes sense, but... Steve? Okay, so those are, those are good questions. So, I mean, on the first question, what, let's say that you had somehow different parties with different views. Okay, I have to say, I don't think this will happen because I think the fact that the views are converging is a reflection of the, of the world that any American president would have to deal with. And if you want to take these two, I think, you know, kind of highlight elements of this world, one is the rise of China, which as I said, any American president is going to try to find some way of dealing with, which will be continued security and engagement. And there is an issue about how tough a stand will take with China economically. But I think what's actually driven American policy up to now is more domestic politics than what the Chinese are doing. If we're really going to go after the Chinese for stealing intellectual property rights, no American president will be able to do that without the support of American corporations. And up to now, American corporations have not strongly gotten on a kind of bandwagon which says, we are going to bring a series of, we'll close our markets to the Chinese unless they stop basically you know, getting as much of our intellectual property as they can as fast as they can. So that's a constraint, but it's also a domestic political constraint. It's that one that will exist because it exists in Congress that will exist for an American president, whether a Republican or a Democrat. And this other big problem, which is not the China problem, which is how do you deal with these badly governed states? You know, these problems that really are a reflection of the domestic character of these countries. Iran doesn't have to have a nuclear weapons program except for the nature of the Iranian regime. Um, and I don't think we know how to deal with those problems very m easily either. So I think that it's very, and those kind of constraints, the lack of kind of a clarity on the one hand, and I think what is sort of a clear policy on China on the other isn't gonna change. All right, there is this kind of reckless, okay, let me move to the second question. Okay, I didn't give a great answer, and I'm gonna try and give a better answer. I'm gonna do something more in a second. This is a really interesting question on, you know, could we be reckless? And, and I think it really bears on, the, and, and where I, I could see that I wasn't giving you a very good answer to the first question, which is that, well, I think the China policy is clear, the kind of what you do with these badly governed states, what do you do with the Palestinian problem, the Arab Spring, Afghanistan, Iraq? I, I guess I think now there's, because of the experience, and this has been not atypical for American foreign policy, because of the experience in Iraq and Afghanistan, which are not, I mean, were not good experiences, and which the American public, I mean, will look at now and say, you know, we spent a lot of blood and treasure there, and it's not clear that we got anything that looks like a reasonable outcome. Um, because of that, I think we'll be pretty reluctant, you know, to, to, you know, jump in on anything. So in that sense, I think, you know, what, what happened in Libya? where whoever it was in the Obama White House who made this statement about um, leading from behind, which you know, has been picked up in the campaign. You know, I think it was an unfortunate statement, but I also think it was not, you know, I think anyone in the White House would have done the same thing. And, and ditto on the problem, the situation in Syria. And I think the problem here is this, who, are we, who would we bet on in these countries? Who are, look, if, if 45, or let's say if 55% if of the Syrian population were really kind of liberal Democrats in some, you know, like small d, we'd be jumping all over ourselves to support them. 
You know, but that's probably about 2% of the population. You know, there was a story in the New York Times a couple of days ago where they were interviewing kids, Syrian kids in a refugee camp, I think, in Jordan. And, you know, they're basically saying, we're going to come to power and we're just going to, these were Sunnis, we're just going to kill all the Alawites. They've been killing us, we're going to kill them. You know, these are 11-year-old kids, but their parents are thinking the same thing. So I think the problem is, if you have no one to bet on, it's really, really hard to jump in, especially if you've seen that jumping in hard, which we did do in Afghanistan and Iraq, hasn't worked out so well. So I, this, you know, your question's really, it's really a good question. I think despite the fact that the absence of a clear notion of what you should do can lead to recklessness, I, I don't think we'll be reckless in, in, you know, in the kind of foreseeable future, whatever that is, you know, a decade or something. Mm -hmm. okay. I'm gonna take a couple questions in the back. Yeah, go ahead, yeah, go ahead. Completely agree with Steve, except for one uncertainty. I mean, this is uh, the 11th anniversary of 9-11. Mm -hmm. Think of another mm -hmm. catastrophic uh, right. transnational right. terrorist event in the United States, and then I don't know yep. what the US will do. So, sorry, but then I think we should keep two dimensions separate. One is what can we do in foreign policy and what should we do? And I think, Steve, you've talked a lot about both international and domestic constraints. So there's no wonder that there will be a lot of continuity from Obama to a potential President Romney. And I think what Thomas just said is what will trigger changes is crisis. It's always a response to something happening. 9-11, you know what? Iraq, Afghanistan, I say, would not have happened without 9-11. So that was a response. It was not a strategy the U.S. had and then acted upon. Now, with regard to the should, I just want to echo what Steve said. I think I've yet to see an example of successful external intervention where external actors have interfered in the country to induce domestic change and bring about regime change was sustainable. And we can talk about Germany and Japan after the Second World War. But then you would have to be willing to put so much money, blood and treasure, and just think about of how much blood and treasure went into Germany and Japan after the Second World War. There's nothing compared to Afghanistan and Iran. So, I mean, with regard to should, should we be reckless? No, we shouldn't. I think we should be prudent and be humble of what we can achieve and accomplish from outside. Okay. I'm going to take actually one question from the back, the far corner on, in this side. This is also your opportunity for a final comment. Hello, my name is Morteza. I'm not a political science student or international studies student. But I'm coming from a country who had a eight years war and was under threat always from the other countries, Iran. And then uh, I'm thinking, I'm, I'm talking about it from, my point of view is a point of view of a person from outside the United States, from a Middle East. Uh, I'm thinking United States has a grand strategy uh, to fight a big enemy. Whenever, when you say that the United States doesn't have a grand strategy because he doesn't have now a grand enemy, as long as he found a grand enemy, then the strategy will be on. Could you please state your question? Yeah, my question is, don't you think that uh, the way that the United States be, uh, you know, behaving or uh, do this behavior against the other countries like Iran or Iraq, Afghanistan, without knowing the, how the society works over there, is, is not a threat to the, to the United States itself? to the foreign policy of the United States itself. Thank you. Okay, so let me say, I mean, say something about the sort of grand strategy and do you need a, a big enemy to fight? Um, and follow up on something that Tanya said. So I think one thing that's absolutely clear and true is that if you look at grand strategies historically, of which there haven't been very many that are successful, Tanya's absolutely right to say that the strategy evolved after the kind of situation was there. So I mean, the United States, doesn't develop containment as a kind of explicit strategy until the early 1950s, even though it's kind of started a strategy of containment as early as 1948. Um, if you look at the question of how the United States reacted to 9-11, so here you have this huge external shock. The United States, what you're saying is absolutely correct. Did the United States have some intimate knowledge of Iraq and Afghanistan? No. But I, I could see this, and I think this is, um, you know, both being in the administration, and it's certainly what was reported, you're confronted with this situation in which 
you see some of that, it's really is a very serious security threat. Although it's, un, it's unclear exactly how serious it is. You develop a strategy to deal with that. All right, what was George W. Bush's strategy? It was a strategy that came from one of the deep strands of American history, which is Wilsonianism, mm -hmm. which is the idea that you could actually spread democracy successfully. So you don't just look, you pull out the successful Germany and Japan cases, you make an argument which was made very forcefully by both President Bush and by other members of the administration, which is that democracy is not just something for white guys in the West, that democracy is a universal set of values, and that if you kind of, you know, if you can get rid of autocratic rulers, you will have democracy evolving. And that was the set of assumptions that the Bush administration used when it went into Afghanistan and Iraq. Right? It's clear that those assumptions, I think, are wrong, that it's very hard to get democracy, that democracy is unusual. But it isn't something that was driven by a kind of notion of a grand enemy. And I think if I could say, I mean, my one last word here on how, you know, thinking about this whole set of issues, I mean, which Tanya's also raised in terms of European Union policy and thinking about democratization and market economies. The problem is we've got a, a relatively small set of countries that are functioning pretty well in the world. Um, and then some countries down at the bottom that are functioning very badly and a bunch of countries in the middle. We don't have really a very clear idea about how if we think countries can somehow move along some sort of continuum, which is obvious is not very and not for a straight line continuum, we don't have a very clear idea of what we hope countries might become. So what should we, even if we said now, today, you know, on September 11th, you know, 2012, if we said, what do we hope Afghanistan will look like in five years? Could we actually give a coherent description of that? We, and I mean all of us, I mean not just us sitting in this room or academics, and also policymakers would have a very hard time doing that. And I think that's just a huge and unsolved issue, you know, in how we conduct our foreign policy. That is, if we think about what we could move Afghanistan to, if I can babble for a second, what is our policy in Afghanistan? Our policy in Afghanistan is to develop, is to develop an Afghan security force that will allow American troops to withdraw. This was the policy of the Bush administration as early as 2005. And it's been the consistent policy of the Obama administration. Honestly, if we withdraw, do we actually think there will be an Afghan army? You know, what will, it, they'll either go, either the, do we think they'll support a, an elected government? If it's really an effective organization, they'll take over the government. The more likely outcome is that each one of these guys with their guns will go back to whatever local warlord they supported at the beginning. So we're following a policy which is articulated, has been articulated across administrations. I would say it makes no sense. It makes no sense. But I don't have, I can't sit here and say, look, here's an alternative policy that if somehow I were, you know, in a position to articulate, I think would make sense. I think the problem is we don't have this sort Alternative policy. I'll, I'll give you the answer to that. You do what Nixon did. You define what victory means, you declare victory, and you leave. That is how the United States will get out of Afghanistan. And, and so having said that, that's my thought anyway, um, I welcome you to join us in a reception to follow. You have an opportunity to engage in some more conversation with our panelists. Let me say thank you to all the people who have helped put this together. And please help me thank our panelists.